What's up guys, today we talk all about the glutes. We start off by describing the glutes and what their functions are, what's the difference between aesthetics and performance, the components of hypertrophy, and we wrap it up by giving our recommendations for good glute training programs. My name is Michael Suna, his name is Rob Silver, and this is The 8-9 Project. All right, Rob, so here we go. So this is an A9 quickie, so we got to get right into it. Today we're going to talk glutes. So let's start off with, and I'll let you take the lead on this. Let's start off with what are, what are the glutes? What are the three muscles of the glutes, and what are their purposes? Yeah. So when we talk about the glutes and to the common exercise enthusiast or common person, when people refer to their glutes, they're usually referring to specifically the largest muscle of the glutes, which is the glute maximus which functions as a hip extensor. So it basically opens up your hips. So when you're standing up out of a chair, your knees extend and your hips extend. The glutes are one of the muscles responsible for extending, or the glute maximus specifically is responsible for extending your hips, making you stand upright. There are two smaller glute muscles, which because of this fascination with the peach have become more common colloquial terms in your gyms and, and whatnot. Glute medius and glute minimus. Those are going to be your smaller muscles of the glutes, hence the terms maximus, biggest, medius, medium, minimus, smallest, easy to remember. The glute medius and glute minimus, they, their function is kind of unique, not unique in the body, but unique compared to the glute maximus in the sense that the glute medius and glute minimus do hip abduction or abduction. That's if you're standing tall and you raise one leg out to the side, that would be hip abduction, abducting away from the body. But at the same point, they also do hip external rotation so if you're standing tall raise your right leg up a little bit and then externally rotate or point your toes out to the side if it's your right foot toes out to the right that's hip external rotation glute medius and glute minimus however when your hip is flexed your glute med and glute minimus now function as hip internal rotators so the moral of that story is their function and this can go for a lot of muscles in the body their function is going to be determined by what's going on at separate joints so if you really want to get into it, you have to understand not just what the muscle is at one joint position. You have to understand where it is during movements, right? So if you're in the bottom of a squat, your hips are flexed. Glute med and glute minimus are going to function more as hip internal rotators. But to get you to get full extension at the top and lock out your hips, now they're going to be more as a external rotator. So their function changes throughout a, a single movement. Got it. Let's let's try to um, divvy up these two demographics of between athletes and aesthetics, right? So a girl, even a guy, that wants to build their glutes, make their butt look better, and then for performance-wise. So for let's talk specifically performance-wise, the athlete. Is there a need to focus specifically on building the glute minimus or does his do their overall training already target these movements? Meaning, you talk about external rotation, right? And I think about a linebacker scraping through the line mm -hmm. trying to fill a gap. He doesn't specifically need to work on this muscle. Squats will do it for him. Lunges, cosset squats, so on and so forth. They're going to work the minimus anyways. For So when we start talking about sports performance, well, first of all, yes, you absolutely need to make sure you're training your glute max glute med glute minimus for function for whatever function might be right function as a human being for daily tasks function for a linebacker doing the tasks that are required of a linebacker your your glute medius and glute minimus since they work more in what we call the frontal plane which is side to side motion are going to be mm -hmm. very important for sports performance so what that means is if you are training athletes can we stop for a second here yeah because i want to be specific here on, on, on the term frontal plane so there are three just for our audience there are three types of uh, types of planes there's a sagittal transverse and frontal right correct and frontal plane is when you're moving side to side so your hand if you put it by your pocket and you lift it up away from you right that's the frontal that's plane. Frontal sagittal plane. is in front of you like if you're doing a lunge mm -hmm. and transverse is basically you're spinning your upper body away from your lower body correct you rotation rotation so okay. generally rotation is going to be transverse plane anything that's movement forward or backward yeah. like a forward or reverse lunge like a squat is going to be what we call sagittal plane most common exercises are going to be sagittal plane frontal plane is side to side like a lateral lunge or a 
lateral raise. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of our training programs, we try to put them through all different types of planes. So we make sure that we're hitting mostly the sagittal and the, the frontal plane. So that's why I think it's important for our audience to know that. Absolutely. You got to train all different planes of motion because think about on a daily basis as a human being, you are always going through all three different planes. So it is your service as an exercise professional, whether it is as a you know gym owner, programmer, personal trainer, strength coach to challenge your individuals in all different planes because that's how they're going to have to function. For our linebacker, mm -hmm. there's going to be, or for our linemen having to cut or pull, they're gonna, there's going to be an excessive amount of power-related frontal plane movement. Right. So you have to target frontal plane. Don't target glute medius or glute minimus specifically in isolation as a bodybuilder might. Okay. Target it as right. an athletic movement where you're doing ballistic, which kind of means jumping, right. lateral lunges, lateral and squats. that's what I want to get to, right. Lateral exactly. kettlebell swings. Right, so they're going to target an individual. So as opposed to now, let's talk a little bit, about, like you said, about our bodybuilder physique or the girl that just wants to, you know, pop her booty out a little bit more. She would focus a little bit more on those, you know, some, maybe some sideline clams or some lateral banded walks in order to target those to fill out her butt, if you will. Correct, yes. You can, you know, the... I'll always, for most people, unless you're, unless you are getting up on a stage and are going to be really nitpicky with the way your peach is looking, right. the isolation style activities, so your clamshells or not bearded clams, that's a little weird, right? <laughs> right. The, the, the names change on a, on a yearly basis. Yeah, of course. Um, those isolation movements might fit well into a warm up. might fit well when you're just kind of introducing this style of movement to your client, but I'll always say try to progress away from it where they mm -hmm. can still be doing your lateral lunges. Mm -hmm. They might You might not be doing them with the loading or the speed that your NFL player or college player or high school player is going to be using, but they're still going to challenge those muscles with greater loading. You know, even if the loading is just body weight, that you'll get better growth and development of those muscles through the more advanced body weight lateral lunge or lateral squat compared to the clamshells. Right. Clamshells right. will have a time and a place, but the goal is eventually to always progress them away. Of course, for your for your women, for your men that are just looking to fill yeah. in their their Banana Republic traveler pants. Right, and it's knowing the individual and how you're going to start them off. It's a lot easier to teach a novice how to you know lay on their left side, put a band by their knees, and just lift one leg away from the other, as opposed to teaching them a costa squat or making sure that everything that they're doing is is performed correctly. So there's there's levels to this. So, um, so we spoke a little bit about the two different individuals. Let's let's wrap this up, Rob. If you had to. Uh, program, and I know that you're coming out with a, a, uh, a routine now, if you had to program for an athlete, um, how many times would you have them uh, working? I'm not going to say specific glutes because we already discussed that we're not going to specifically work on the glutes. We're going to work on movements, mm -hmm. athletic performance movements that's going to obviously develop their glutes. Because if you look at, I'm going to use our specific community. If you look at the CrossFit community, you being one of them, these are some of the nicest asses that you've seen on athletes everywhere. I'm right? blushing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I remember Wadapalooza, everybody, you know, complimenting on, damn, that white boy's got a booty. Yeah, and, Rob, and, and if you look at this across the board, the girls and the guys, they all have these well-developed glutes, and it's because of all the functional movements that we do. Mm -hmm. I would argue, I would say that most CrossFitters don't target, maybe now a little bit more than, than we used to, but we wouldn't target. It was almost... Um, uh, you were looked down upon. It was taboo if you targeted an isolated muscle. Now we do a little bit more of it, but still, even back in the days, everybody had these amazing glutes, right? So if you had to program for performance um, on somebody that says, Rob, yeah, I want to build my glutes a little bit, but I'm an athlete, what would be some of the movements? How many times a week would they hit it? Your rep ranges that you would work in? Just give me like a broad scope here. Yeah, and... I'm going to take a step back almost on that and provide a little bit of an answer to the first portion of that was where you're talking about CrossFitters in general and people who perform these functional exercises tend to have pretty well-developed mm -hmm. posterior chains. Yeah. From a physiological per perspective, some of the training components that make up hypertrophy or muscle growth, one of them is going to be heavy exercises. Heavy compound exercises are going to stimulate growth hormones throughout the body. They're not going to make you look like a man if you're a woman, so don't use them as an excuse to not do your barbell compound exercises like a back squat or a front squat, but those exercises, when performed specifically in an, in an 
anabolic rep range, six to eight reps heavy, five to six reps heavy, they're going to stimulate muscle growth with whatever exercises you're going to follow up with or in the muscles that were targeted specifically, right? Crossfitters, competitive exercisers, whatever it is, they perform a lot of heavy barbell exercises in the five to six, you know, three to 10 rep range. So they're going to be stimulating those growth hormones. So that's one component. Another component of hypertrophy or muscle growth is going to be high volume eccentrics. Nothing says high volume eccentrics more in competitive exercising than high volume wall balls. Let me, let's stop right there for a second. For the audience, what is eccentrics? So think about, I'm going to assume now that if you've performed wall balls before and you've probably been sore from doing wall balls before, you don't get sore from the concentric portion or where you're standing up and throwing the ball is from when you are catching it and then deaccelerating it back down into the bottom of your squat. That's where you get sore. That's why it hurts so much to sit down onto the toilet instead of getting up from the toilet the next day. So would you say that a concentric, and I'm trying to break this down a little bit deeper, a concentric movement is the shortening of the angle or the shortening of the muscle? Eccentric is the long and the, the lengthening of that muscle, correct? Under load. Under load, okay. Right, because... When you're doing a bicep curl, the tricep is lengthening. It's I not wanted. going through an eccentric contraction, right? Yeah. When you're lowering the dumbbells on a bicep curl, your tricep is shortening, but it's not undergoing an eccentric contraction or a concentric contraction because it's not the muscle that's under load. It's your bicep that's under load. So yeah. you have to always refer to the muscle that's under load, under load. right? So during a bicep curl, concentric is when you're bringing the dumbbells up eccentric is when you're slowly lowering them or even just lowering them under some form of control your biceps lengthening but it's still in control of the weight and eccentric causes a whole lot of muscle damage eccentric causes a lot of muscle damage which will then thus stimulate hypertrophy because remember you you get bigger when you're recovering when you're repairing your muscles so high volume eccentrics are really common in competitive exercising part of the reason why we see such muscle growth in Competitive ec ec exercise in CrossFit, it's, you know, there is something to that statement. There are other factors as well when we start talking into rest intervals. You minimize rest intervals and maximize work under moderate heavy loading. That's bodybuilding in a nutshell. Minimize rest intervals, sounds like competitive exercise. Moderate loading, sounds like competitive exercise. As much work and in minimal time, sounds like competitive exercise, right? So there are a lot of similarities between competitive CrossFit and bodybuilding right okay so um you you were saying competitive exercise and i want them to know that you're alluding to crossfit crossfit the strength and conditioning program not necessarily across the games which we had discussed before and um and let's talk for a second here you said we tear our muscle fibers right so we create muscle damage and then we recover we rest and recover and that's when we grow correct, correct. that that repairing of muscle is da during downtime yep right and this is something that's extremely important to a lot of a lot of our novice and even some of our intermediate athletes it's because i think the elite already understand that they need to rest in order to grow I, they understand what they're doing but this this no days off concept um if taken literally could actually get you moving backwards rather than forward Correct. Rest and recovery is extremely important when it comes to muscle hypertrophy. Exercise can be a good stress or a bad stress. It, it comes down to recovery. Okay. Right. And if it's a bad stress, it's going to lead to long-term health complications, whether it is injured joints because you're always doing specific movements, or it could be high levels of cortisol, which then lead to tissue breakdown chronically, which is not a good thing. Okay. So let's let's wrap this up with what's your favorite movement if um, if Julie was to tell you, I want to build my booty. What's what? What's the only move? And I can only do one movement. What is it? What would you pick? For a, a general, the, the best answer to that, a single movement that will satisfy a lot of people uh, for building the glutes would be a reverse lunge, okay. a loaded reverse lunge, whether it's dumbbells at the side or for your more advanced, a barbell on the back. Okay. The bar you, you surprised me there because I thought you were going to go with your favorite movement of all, which is always the squat. Uh, right. A back squat or a Bulgarian squat would be definitely included, but you gave me one, right, so I, I think the one, reverse right. lunge has much more utility um, in terms of its use in general population, but obviously back squat and Bulgarian squat are both there 
ready, you know, ready to use when the when the athlete's ready. Okay, and I'm gonna choose uh, the hip thrust only because I'm a huge fan of Brett Contreras and that developed the hip thrust, and and it's extremely popular. Not because it's popular on on uh, social media, but only because it's popular. I, I I like the fact that it puts a load. Uh, a horizontal load while in full extension. So the only thing holding up the the bar is the contraction of the glutes and obviously some crossover with the hamstring there. So if, if all of my girls do hip extension, most of my athletes do hip extension, and we program it into um, our daily workouts uh, once or twice a week for our members here as well. So, all right, Rob, that's all the time that we have for today's Quickie A Night Glutes. Hope you guys enjoyed this program. Your feedback is extremely important to us, so please leave a comment under this social media post. We promise to read all the comments and answer all the questions. And remember, we put this out there to kill all the bullshit. The louder the voice, the clearer the message. Thank you, guys.